This is my box of human nature. It contains everything in it that's in your nature. What does that mean? Well, in short, if it's in your nature, it's unchangeable, it's undeniable, it's part of your very constitution. And it's in a box because it's impervious to everything outside of it, locked in a cage, unadaptable. The question is, what do you think is in the box? Do you think the box is full, empty, somewhere in between? On the other hand, outside of the box, we have all of this, the environment, all that stuff around you that's ever been around you, that has an effect on you, how you're formed, how you develop, who you are as a person. Does any of this get inside the box? Maybe the box is empty, a blank slate, as the philosopher John Locke put it, filled up as you grow up, as you develop. Seriously, what do you think might be in here? We're going to skim over some complicated sounding things. DNA, genetics, epigenetics, methylation, phenotypes, stress, twin studies, Steven Pinker, and early intervention programs. But I want to avoid being technical as much as possible because most crucially, most simply, this box is about a fundamentally philosophical idea, freedom. Debates about nature-nurture inform almost every area of human life, from biology and botany to economics, literature and history. To simplify, thinkers on the nature side have, in varying ways, argued that at least parts of your body and mind are behind an impenetrable skin, cannot be gotten to by upbringing, education, politics or culture. They're often referred to as nativists. They believe we have an innate human nature. Of course, it's undeniable that people grow, change, adapt, interact with the world. But nativists believe that this change, at least in some part, emerges from the box. Imagine a one-way street. You might have an innate eye color or a creativity that comes out of your DNA one way. Nothing gets in to it. To take one example, the English philosopher Thomas Hobbes argued that we are naturally competitive. We sought glory. We're prone to violence. These things come out of us. They have an effect on others. But no culture, politics, education, upbringing or environmental change could change that fundamental, universal, timeless fact. On the other hand, we have empiricists. They, roughly speaking, believe in a two-way street instead of a one-way street. Another English philosopher, John Locke, for example, thought that the mind was a tabula rosa, a blank slate, and all humans were shaped, in different ways, by their experiences, what they see, hear, touch, what they're taught, how they're raised. Experience comes in. Okay, let's return to those nativists, the ones who believe that we have a nature. What is it that they actually believe is behind the barrier in the box? Well, depending on who you ask, it can be anything from IQ, a capacity for violence, economic self-interestedness, a propensity for addiction, the likelihood of a certain disease at a certain age, the list goes on. There are two things I want to think about here. First, what does the evidence say? And second, what are the consequences of that evidence today for philosophy and politics? What does it mean for human society if either nature or nurture are true? 
The central point that's been made across the history of this debate is this. If people have a nature, if they're trapped in the box, then it's no good doing any intervening to try and improve things. Intervention here is the key word. What parts of us are malleable? And who or what is shaping those parts? Who or what is intervening, nurturing upon our lives? We'll return to this question at the end. But first, the idea that we have a nature has been approached in countless ways, philosophically, psychologically, theologically. But the most persuasive throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, the best place to start is biology, the study of DNA and our genes. OK, bear with me while we get technical for just a second. To get to the foundation of nature nurture, we have to talk about DNA. All of life is about replication. You came, as most species did, from a single cell. A cell that contains everything that's in your nature, everything that's in that box. The cell duplicates and divides into two, which then divide into four, and to eight, and sixteen, and thirty-two, and so on, until in a human, they reach 50 trillion. Each of those cells contains DNA in the nucleus in the center, which is made up of a long double helix of chemicals called base pairs. Humans have three billion base pairs, and they are 99% identical for all of us. The order of those base pairs, which are made up of only four molecules, A, G, T, or C, determine everything from eye color to toenails to neurons. The order of the base pairs in the DNA tells the cell what to do and how to replicate itself. And when a cell replicates, the DNA helix unravels and tells the cells which ingredients it needs to make two new strands. Genes and the DNA that make them guide everything in life. They tell the cell which proteins to make, which are the building blocks of all life. Proteins make up the structure of the body, are used to transport blood, used as antibodies, as a defence. They come in all shapes and sizes. And there could be up to 400,000 proteins in the human body. And the code for how to make them comes from the DNA strands in each and every cell. So if anything is in the nature box, DNA is. It's at the bottom of that one-way street the absolute inside. DNA replicates itself, passes it on into the next box it creates. It contains the ingredients, the blueprint, the code to make someone tall or intelligent or a self-interested Hobbesian brawler or autistic maybe or quick-witted and no amount of environmental stuff outside can change it because it stays the same in every cell, from when you're born to when you pass down your genes to the next generation. But is this really true? Remember, all of life is about the duplication of cells, and all of cells contain the same DNA, your human nature. And your DNA is your DNA, unchangeable by the environment around it. But when this was discovered in the 19th century, some people began to wonder if DNA makes everything, but always the same in each cell of the creature, how does, when it replicates, it begin to know when to make a head, a nose, a liver, a neuron, a hair, a nail, a blood cell? When the first cell you came from divided into two, did one of those cells contain your legs and your feet and the top contain your neck and head and brain? One scientist, Hans Dreisk, even decided to separate the cells of sea urchin embryos, thinking they'd grow into two separate deformed sea urchins, a top and a bottom. But to his surprise, they grew into two normal healthy urchins. 
In other words, when our cells divide, there must be some mechanism for telling the cells how to divide, something to tell the DNA what to do. So it cannot be a one-way street. Something, some message has to go the other way, has to get to the box to signal to it what to do. Where does this come from? The answer, of course, the environment. DNA must be nurtured in some way. Nobel laureate Christiane Nusslein Volhard writes that the cell receives signals and information from the environment, including the neighbouring cells. This information is transmitted to the genes. In this manner, the fate of a cell is dependent on both the cytoplasm and external influences. So what the DNA does depends on how it interacts with other molecules, the proteins and cells it encounters. That is everything around it. It receives signals in some way from the environment. It cannot be a one-way street. But how? Only in the last few decades has a revolutionary answer to this question been discovered. One that's having a huge impact on almost every field, from biology to philosophy. Epigenetics. Okay, back to that one-way street. Genetic determinism is the idea that your characteristics and traits come out of the box, that they are nature, and they come out in the same way irregardless of any environmental interaction with them. They come out of your DNA and make you. Epigenetics, meaning on or above genetics, is the discovery that whatever's in the box can be switched on and off. And even more than that, can act like a dimmer switch, producing more or less of some quality. To know what to do, how to act, DNA requires signals from the environment. It needs to know which of the millions of combinations to execute and express. It simply cannot be unresponsive to environmental signals. DNA contains so much data, it boggles the mind. If unwound, it would be around two meters long in each of those 50 trillion cells. But certain molecules from the environment, called histones and methyl groups, can wind themselves around the DNA, bunch it up so that a particular part of the DNA cannot express itself. The information is silenced. This is called methylation. Another group of chemicals, acetals, open the DNA so that it can express itself again. These processes are the ones that are right at the foundation of nature-nurture and show us that that duality of nature or nurture is nonsensical. What we in some way have, and even this isn't accurate, is nature and nurture interacting in a dance. DNA has what biologists call regulatory sites that different molecules are able to bind to, changing the function of the DNA, telling it what to do. This discovery has had some groundbreaking implications for so many areas. Memory, cancer, depression, obesity, autism, addiction, ageing, exercise, nutrition, toxins. We'll look at a few of them, and then we'll return to think a little bit more about some philosophy and think of the implications of what we've learned. Randy Jertle and Michael Skinner write that the word environment means vastly different things to different people. For sociologists and psychologists, it conjures up visions of social group interactions, family dynamics and maternal nurturing. Nutritionists might envision food pyramids and dietary supplements, whereas toxicologists think of water, soil and air pollutants. But scientists now have evidence that these vastly different environments are all able to alter gene expression and change phenotype, that is, the characteristic, the trait, like eye colour, in part by impinging on and modifying the epigenome. 
I want to ask this. Where are the clearest places this process happens? Where does the environment affect us in ways we have direct evidence for? Are those places limiting or expanding our freedom? And how can we think about that more simply and more philosophically? How can we think about the consequences? One, toxins and pollutants. They've been shown to have an effect on cognitive functioning of children, as do mercury and some plastics and pesticides. Pollution in the form of fossil fuel combustion has been shown to be associated with poorer test results in kids. Frequencies of refuse collection, access to toilets and cleanliness of water have all been shown to be associated with cognitive performance in many low-income countries. And of course, all of these disproportionately affect poorer neighbourhoods. too. Noise, aircraft, traffic, crowded living conditions can all lead to poorer reading skills, higher blood pressure and an increase in stress hormones. Poorer parents have less time to stimulate infants, which has negative outcomes later in life. A lack of stimulating materials, books, toys etc. has the same results. Smaller classrooms, on the other hand, have a positive effect. Three nutrition. It's been found that a whole range of dietary habits leave epigenetic marks. Stress or famine, even when you're in the womb, lead to outcomes like obesity and stress for decades into the future. 4, 5 and 6, stress, anxiety and depression, or mental health disorders more broadly. Okay, let's slow down. I think stress is important. It shows a lot about this topic. Studies have shown that rats who are licked and groomed by their mothers in the first 10 days of their lives respond better to stressful events later in life. Rats from low licking and grooming mothers are more likely to become startled and act fearfully throughout their lives. And researchers found that the DNA had been methylated to stop a stress-reducing hormone from being produced. Neuroscientist David Moore writes that this conclusion is supported by a study of rat pups whose mothers were so stressed out that they treated their newborns abusively by frequently stepping on them, dropping them, dragging them or handling them roughly. As a result of this maltreatment, the offspring grew up to have altered patterns of methylation in their brains. And studies on mice and monkeys show similar epigenetic changes throughout their lives. The breadth of these studies has important philosophical and political consequences. When it comes to stress, our bodies are almost identical to rats, but furthermore, suicide victims have also been found to have high levels of genetic methylation, as have victims of abuse and individuals whose mothers had depression while they were pregnant. The thing with... The thing with methylation is that it's hard, it's hard to get off, it's sticky. So early childhood experiences can literally get under your skin and really affect how your DNA operates for the rest of your life. Another study found a relationship between poverty in the first five years you've lived and epigenetic changes 20 to 35 years later. It makes complete sense that animals and humans from more stressful early infant environments display high stress responses later in life, because the environment you're born into is a good predictor of what the rest of your life might look like. You might need your body to fight or flight more, have higher stress responses in areas with more predators, or more loan sharks. Poverty becomes biology. But you might be saying, of course there are still things in the box. We have the DNA. You couldn't epigenetically adapt the DNA to produce wings, and some people are surely naturally better at certain things and not as good at others. The DNA is surely still the DNA. Well, to think about this, we need to look at twins. Identical twins have and come from the same box. If they're raised in different environments and the same stuff comes out, well, the box is unchanged. We've found nature, whatever it is. 
the largest study of twins started in 1994 and looked at over 10,000 pairs of twins from the UK, the US and the Netherlands. They looked at twins who have been raised together, raised together up to a certain age and raised apart and look for similarities and differences between them. If they've been raised apart all their lives but display identical traits, then it must be in the DNA, regardless of the environment. To summarise the results briefly, researchers have estimated that around half of these twins' traits could be attributed to their genes, and the other half to their environment. So, around half and half. It's been found in another recent study that young identical twins have similar epigenetic markings, but as they get older, they diverge. In other words, as their environment and experience changed them. Intelligence is also found to be increasingly heritable as twins get older. That is, as twins catch up with each other, regardless of their environment, how they've been raised, where they went to school, where they live. Some researchers have put the number as high as two-thirds nature and just a third nurture. But are we really seeing nature in these studies? First, in one recent meta-study. That's a study of studies. It's been found that in most of them, the term raised apart was used very loosely. Many of the twins were actually raised together, and many knew each other. One study reviewed 121 cases that claimed to be raised apart. Only three had actually been separated shortly after birth and only just been reunited. Most had actually had an average of 10 years together at some point. Many of them were separated between the ages of 8 and 11. And most, almost all in fact, shared the same culture, the same socio-economic background, or knew each other as adults. And on top of this, of course, they shared the same environmental signals in the womb and the same conditions in the first weeks of their lives. Look at this quote from epidemiologist David Barker about plasticity in development. He says, There are good reasons why it may be advantageous in evolutionary terms for the body to remain plastic during development. It enables the production of phenotypes that are better matched to their environment than would be possible if the same phenotype was produced in all environments. Plasticity during intrauterine life enables animals and humans to receive a weather forecast from their mothers that prepares them for the type of world in which they have to live. If the mother is poorly nourished, she signals to her unborn baby that the environment it is about to enter is likely to be harsh. The baby responds to these signals by adaptions such as reduced body size and altered metabolism, which help it to survive a shortage of food after birth. Okay, let's try and bring this together in some way. There are things in the box, propensities, may be, but they're expressed in a wide variety of ways, epigenetically, depending on how they interact with the rest of the environment. The way our nature is expressed is dependent on a wide range of phenomena, like we've seen, toxins, pollutants, stress, education, culture, politics, prolonged experiences, levels of threat, in-womb development, The list is endless, and we're only really just starting to see how far it goes. So does that mean we're more blank slates? Or do these propensities mean we have a type of human nature? How can we make sense of this? So we have to ask, do separated twins really escape this environmental effect? Steven Pinker's influential book, The Blank Slate, has a handy list of what he and anthropologist Donald Brown describe as human universals, meaning in our nature, impervious to everything outside of it, the environment. Pinker handily tries to list all of them. You can see them through the link I've put in the description below. Have a look. Some of them, like tools, fear, fire, and cultural relativity, just to name a few, are almost laughable, or at the very least simplified or shallow. 
Fire, for example, it's not human nature. It's not in our DNA, in our genes. It's environmental. It's an interaction. And also, I could conceivably live my entire life without it. And we have innovations that have superseded it in some way. And that's just one. But take fear. Okay, we all, I think, with a few exceptions, have experienced fear. Is it nature or nurture then? I'd say we have something like the raw ingredients for fear, or a propensity for fear, in the box. But the way those ingredients come together, and are expressed, and interact with the environment, are impossible to understand without looking at the outside world, looking at culture and society and philosophy and change. I think you can still, despite things like a propensity for fear being in the box, make a strong case for something like blank slatism. There is no sense in which an idea or feeling of fear is imprinted on the mind, or body for that matter, in a universally, genetically determined, specific way before you are born. You have the biochemical propensity, the ingredients for it, in your DNA. The DNA is then epigenetically expressed in a variety of ways, and depending on your environment, which includes the womb and the parents' environment, remember, before it even gets to the slate of the mind, the blank slate. It's then mixed with other cultural, social and environmental factors that we absorb from experience that code or script the biology, chemistry and idea of fear in many ways which may or may not, depending on the period and the culture, be expressed in particular ways, for a particular period of time with certain triggers. Of course, what many of us are interested in when we're talking about nature, nurture, is not that we have fears, hormones, legs, need food, have a culture, those human universals, but how those supposed universals are expressed in the environment, by the environment, how our DNA unfolds, collides, synthesizes, with the rest of the world, and that genetic determinism, the idea that nothing gets to the box and everything comes out, justifies one political, cultural and social position in particular, individualistic non-intervention. That because people are what their genetic inheritance is, Intervention is an intrusive waste of time, money, and resources. So, if our genes are now conclusively affected by the environment, what does this mean philosophically, culturally, politically? Well, we are intervened upon by our environment and other people in a way that's outside of our control when we're young. The obvious question here is, where does this happen in a detrimental way, and where does it happen in a useful way? You could go in many directions with this, but here are a few consequences I think we can take from what we've looked at. First, responsibility and blame. If we're affected in our genes by pollution, upbringing, economic development, stimulation of many kinds, then we have to acknowledge that there are more people responsible for the genetic expression in one person than that individual themselves. Who then is responsible? The parents? The wider community? The polluter? The nation? These are wider questions about justice. Second, Liberty. The political philosopher Asaya Berlin talked about negative liberty, the freedom from interference, and positive liberty, the freedom to do something. Science can help us think about both. To grow in an environment free from pollution is one thing, but to live in a stimulating environment, to have access to books, to good education, welfare, creates the freedom to do more later in life. 
I think thinking about epigenetics allows us to think about those freedoms from things and freedom to develop in the fullest possible way. That's a social responsibility because the individual is not responsible for how he's developing at that young age. Third, we might think about intervention, who's best suited at what times and where. One of the most interesting conclusions from recent epigenetic studies is that much of this happens and happens to us in the first few years of life, if not in development in the womb. So before we end, I think it's important to have a quick look at where I think many of these studies lead. Early intervention. I think one of the main takeaways from all of this is how much the first few years of a child's life, including the nine months of pregnancy, affect them for the rest of their lives. We usually think of education as the primary mode of improving a child's environment, but that's not enough. A UK government report found that funding should be shifted from later to earlier interventions, and the children's charity, the Wave Trust argues that governments should focus on preventing adverse childhood experiences like abuse, neglect and mental illness, etc. And we already have some programmes like this. Sure Start in the US and Head Start in the UK. But I think we're only just beginning to work out how to best utilise them. The first head of Head Start, Naomi Eisenstadt, wrote on the London School of Economics blog that The substantial success of the Sure Start scheme has been that the argument about the role government should play between birth and school is now won. We no longer need to deliver more evidence that the preschool years are vital to children's development and that provision of services for young children and families is critically important. The acceptance that there should be provision for such services and that government has a role in regulating and at least partly funding this is now firmly in place. There are also programmes like the Nurse Family Partnership in the UK that assigns nurses to low-income families for frequent visits. But we also need to recognise that this isn't enough. A handful of visits and limited funding cannot make up for a history of generational poverty. We should treat having children like the most highly skilled job you can possibly do. Because it is. And it has the most consequences for society. We should offer extensive education and courses to pregnant couples and ensure the home environment is as good as it possibly can be. We should extend parental leave and reorganise childcare around the discovery that the first few years of a child's life are crucial. This is, before we even get to the moral and ethical case, just a good return on investment. It used to be thought that genetics were passed down like a blueprint, a precise guide to engineer the body, a code, a script, a recipe book, maybe. But genetics are more like a script that can be read differently depending on the context. As Nessa Kerry has argued, different interpretations of Romeo and Juliet, say, change over time in movies, stage, song, retellings in literature. But I think we can go even further than that. It turns out that actually there's so much in the box But it interacts with so much of the outside world in so many different ways that it's less a cage and more like a TARDIS, a party, an adventure of some kind that quite literally contains the ingredients for every chef's kitchen that's ever existed, the words of every writer and everything they've ever written, the code that every computer program uses in the world. There's so much to play with in here. But for those three billion pairs, those base pairs of ingredients that we have in here, there are then six billion others in the world, seven billion, nine billion now, to play around with, to interact with. Not to mention the genes and the DNA in every other species 
flora and fauna and the rest of the natural world itself. So I find that not closed up, but actually quite open and exciting. Okay, I'll leave you with a quote from the early 20th century psychologist William James that I think is even more pertinent in the light of epigenetic discoveries. Compared with what we ought to be, we are only half awake. Our fires are damp, but our drafts are checked. We are making use of only a small part of our physical and mental resources. Stating the thing broadly, the human individual lives far within his limits. Thank you as always for watching, and a huge thanks of course, as always, to my Patreons, without which this just wouldn't be possible. So if you want to see scripts, if you want to chat in the Discord server, if you want your name in the credits, but most of all, if you just want to help support make this content, then click the link in the description below. If not, you can like, you can share, you can leave a comment, all those things that help the algorithm. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time.